know that you made a way when our paths were against the wall and it looked as if it was over you made a way and we're standing here only because you made a way message to you this morning that I've entitled The Defeat of Death. The Defeat of Death. And I base it on John chapter 11. 
two verses, verse 25 and 26. John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. But I would like to read a little bit more to give you the context. So I will begin reading from verse 16. And I'll read all the way down to verse 27. So follow, follow on the screen as I read John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verses 16 through 27. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> who is the him? That's Jesus. He said, Let's go, we're going to die with Jesus. So when Jesus came, he found that he, he had already been in the tomb four days. Who was in the tomb for four days? Lazarus. <laughs> Lazarus was dead. Now, verse 18. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. You know that these were the sisters of Lazarus, right? They're mourning. Look at verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. The word of the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, help us to understand your word. Illuminate us by the power of your Holy Spirit and use this word to conform everyone here to the image of your dear son Jesus, in whose matchless name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The defeat of death. The defeat of death. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to die? Are you ready to die? Listen, your attitude when death looks you in the face will expose the true nature of your spiritual condition. And it will do more than that. It will expose the confidence or lack of confidence with which you will face life and living. This is why biblical Christianity has placed such an emphasis on the doctrine of the resurrection. This is at the heart of the gospel. What do you believe about this doctrine? Do you really understand what it's all about? I can tell you this. What you believe about it will make all the difference in the world concerning every aspect of your life. The verses I want to look at this morning are verses 25 and 26. This classic and comprehensive statement of the doctrine of the resurrection talks about at least two factors. One, a victorious reality. And two, a victorious response. A reality... And the response, what our Lord Jesus was saying, on the one hand, <laughs> was that there is a resurrection reality in him. Yeah. Come on now. A resurrection reality in whom? In him. And on the other hand, <laughs> there should be a resurrection response in us. A resurrection response in us. So let us explore both of these factors in this message. Okay, number one, the victorious reality. 
All I need here is just the first part of verse 25. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, when our Lord said, I am the resurrection and the life, what exactly did he mean? This statement is pregnant with a lot of theological truth, but I would just like to take a look at a couple of issues. First, let us stress the first words. He says, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. What's he saying? He is saying that he is the embodiment of resurrection. He is the epitome of resurrection. He is resurrection. He is it. He will not only be resurrected, he is re the essence of resurrection. I am. Here our Lord Jesus was trying to show us that he embodied resurrection for those who are true believers. We need to learn this this morning. He was raised for believers. Yes. For the elect. Our Lord was not saying, I will be resurrected, though he will be resurrected. <laughs> he was not saying, I will show you how you can live so that you will be resurrected. No, 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 no. He was not saying that either. He was saying, I am the resurrection. I am your resurrection. I am the way anybody gets resurrected. My resurrection is yours. I have been raised for you. By the way, have you noticed that the essence of Christianity comes down to personal pronouns? Uh, some of you pay attention. I said the essence of Christianity comes down to personal pronouns. If you are here this morning saying, look, the Son of God was born, he died, he was raised, he ascended, he is coming again, that doesn't make you a Christian. That does not make you a Christian. All that means is that you have learned some important facts about what true Christians believe. But reciting the same doesn't make you a biblical Christian. But if you say from the bottom of your heart, if you say it from your being that the Lord Jesus Christ was born for me, he, he died for me, he, he was raised for me, he was ascended to the right hand of the Father for me, and that he's coming again for me. That is the essence of Christianity. That is a serious confession of faith. The Apostle Paul wrote about it in Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. He explained that our Lord Jesus was the one who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Romans 4, 25. He was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. We're not Christians and we don't understand Christianity if we just understand that Jesus was raised. We have to understand that he was raised for us. For true believers. The Apostle Paul says, for our salvation. Well, you might want to say, well, how could this be? I know that he died for us. He died to pay for our sins. But how could he be raised for our salvation? What, what, what did that do for us? Well, here is what he did and what it did. It's very important when you go shopping. We buy an item in the store, get your receipt. Now, I know a lot of you don't think receipts are important. <laughs> you don't even pick it up sometimes. We need to make sure they staple it to the bag or that they put it in our hands so it's readily available because very often they are security personnel who walk around at the exits who are watching. And uh, we'd better have our receipt with us because if we have a receipt, that is the way of guaranteeing that we won't have to pay for that item again. Come on now. Because a receipt is saying ownership has transferred from the store to you. Without the receipt, there is no way you can prove <laughs> that those items are yours. Okay? So, if we're walking along towards the door and one of the security people said hey, hey hold it there wait you wait there is that really your merchandise well what do we do what do we do we whip out the receipt with confidence come on man if you have your receipt you're, you're not timid now you're confident mm, we defy them 
Sometimes we might even want to know where you trouble me for. What, why are you interfering with me? Okay, because why? Why are you so confident? Come on, man, you have your receipt. <laughs> you whip it out and you say, look at this. I paid for this. I'm not paying again. No, sir. I don't ever have to pay again. And so all they can say is, go right ahead, ma'am. You're free to go. You're free to go. Brothers and sisters, listen. There are a lot of people here in this church this morning who may not believe that they can ever be free from some awful things they have done in the past. Some awful failures, some obvious inadequacies. And you think, my goodness, it's not hung around my neck forever. Somebody always reminding me. Many of you have been taught, or sometimes you teach yourself or both, that these are, are not things that you could ever put behind you. In your mind, they are not things that you are ever going to really be able to live down. You, you, you are convinced that you will never be able to forget them. Certainly people are going to try to remind you. <laughs> In your mind, you will always have to live with them. L you listen to me this morning. If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, God says no. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus paid the price and he gave you your receipt. Oh, come on. You say, what, what, what is this to see? <laughs> How do I know that Jesus has paid in full for everything? How do I know that Jesus has paid so that I will never have to pay again? How do I know? Well, God has given you a receipt. Well, what, what is the receipt? When our Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, God stamped, paid in full across the pages of history in letters that we can all through the eyes of faith see. God was saying this payment was sufficient. You never have to pay for these sins again. Do you understand that? Do you have your receipt? Do you look at the resurrection and say that's God's way of saying to me that I will never have to pay for the things that I've done again because Jesus <laughs> paid it all and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain but he washed it white as snow. Do you live with resurrection power? That's your receipt. <laughs> there are people out there, hateful people who take pride in bringing up anything from your past to shame you. That's their job. Their job is to memorize your failures and bring them up to throw them in your face. Okay? That's, they think that's their job. They are determined to assassinate your character. Sometimes, if they can't find anything, they just make up something. Are you following me? But because of the resurrection, you may boldly invite them to bring it on. For God has raised up, raised up Jesus from the dead to give you the right to shout, I'm covered. That's what were you talking about there? That's paid for. <laughs> this business has been removed from consideration. It is old news. It is irrelevant. It is gone. Gone as far as the east is from the west. <laughs> Hallelujah. When our Lord said, I am the resurrection, he meant I'm raised for you. Let us look at the last part of the statement. I didn't just want to emphasize I am, whether he is the embodiment of the resurrection. But he says, I am the resurrection. Our Lord was not only telling us that he was raised for us. He was also saying, I have achieved what? Victory and power over death. I am the embodiment of resurrection. I came here to kill death. I came here to destroy it. Death looms over and casts a huge shadow on all of us. And right now in contemporary Western culture, there are at least two ways that people deal with the monstrosity called death. And death is a monstrosity. <laughs> Nobody can live a day without some kind of strategy for dealing with the reality and inevitability of death. It's all around us. The death is all around us. We can't get away from death. It's in our face. Mm. 
And right now, people are responding by death basically in two ways. Hmm? But they're both inadequate. Most people today, first of all, deny it. They're in denial. What, how do they talk? They say, let's not talk about death. death. Death is obscene. Death is something we're not going to talk about. As a pastor for 36 years and counting, I have officiated at many funerals. I have noticed that many in many cases, people respond to death like a bunch of prisoners in jail who make up their mind that they're not going to talk about it, they're not going to deal with it, they're not going to cope with it. That's their way of handling incarceration. They promise never to talk about it, never to mention that they were in the jail, uh, never to make any reference to it. They just sit there and talk about everything except the fact that they're in the jail. Well, stay with me. They refuse to remind each other about it, so they try to forget about it themselves. It is a kind of conspiracy of silence. Let's not admit that we're in jail. Let's deny it. Let's never talk about it. Let's, let's never make a re reference to it at all. The only problem is that you can't keep it up. You can't keep it up. And this is what happens at a funeral. At a funeral... This person that we love and know, they're in the casket. Rude awakening. They died. You can't keep it up because it's going to be right in your face. Like you're in the jail and they slammed the door. And you just remember you had something to do this afternoon and they say, where you, where you, where you think you're going? <laughs> huh? Rude awakening. <laughs> mm, it's kind of embarrassing, you know. It's embarrassing because we are then forced to deal with the one thing we pledge to ignore. The big elephant in the room has begun to throw its weight around. For society's sake, many think that we must hide the unbearable disturbance caused by the ugliness of dying. Many people seem to have this irrational desire to believe that life must always be happy. For them, death is the bleakest admission of despair. So, if anybody begins to actually admit to themselves the inevitability and the reality of death, they imagine that life has been drained of all the joy. They will shout, come on, no, come on, man. Don't talk like that. Don't spoil the day with that morbid language. So they deal with death by denying it or by ignoring it. Now, the other way some deal with death is to sentimentalize it. Mm. It is just another approach that tries to get around the problem. This is when they say, okay, all right, all right, let's not be afraid of death. Let's face it and let's say it's our friend. Let's defang death. Let, let's tell ourselves that death is just a natural thing. That death is not so awful. We will affirm that death is a beautiful thing. It's a peaceful thing. We will insist that death is just the final stage of life. Death is just the final stage. And so this is how they deal with it. Haven't you heard that before? <laughs> and when you hear it viscerally... <laughs> I'm talking about deep down inside. In your heart, you know it's a damnable lie. You just know it's stupidness. This lie is a cosmetic statement that works about as well as putting lipstick and rouge on a skeleton. All it does is make it more hideous. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible gives us an understanding of death that is the only realistic way to live in freedom in this world. The Bible says, first of all, that death is an enemy. It's an enemy. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26, the apostle Paul wrote, The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. It is an enemy. It's not a friend. We know it's not a friend. When we get in the presence of death, we sense immediately that it's not a friend. Oh, yeah, for a little while at first, sometimes under some circumstances when somebody dies, they can look tremendously and angelically peaceful in the casket. Or wherever you find them, on the bed or on the floor, they look so peaceful. Hmm? 
You go ahead. <laughs> Just leave them alone for three or four days and you'll see what peace is there. Death is a twisting, perverting, and destructive thing. It is actually abnormal. He said, Pastor, how are we going to say it's abnormal and you have them every day? Well, I speak from the perspective of how God originally created the world. Death is the result of sin. The day you eat thereof, you shall what? It's the result of sin. It's not a friend. It is an enemy. We hate it. That's why we hate it. And it happens every day. We know it's an enemy. <laughs> we hate it. We know viscerally that we were not meant for this. And even in the presence of Lazarus, we see that we were not meant for it. Our Lord himself was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. And what did he do? Did God incarnate... Um, Reprimand them? No, he wept too. He joined them. Jesus wept. Please notice that our Lord did not reprimand the mourners for their weeping. He did not say, you guys don't have a clue, you know. I, But I know what I'm going to do. He didn't say, you are weeping, but wait until you see what happened. No, no, he didn't say anything like that. He saw them weeping and he joined them. He wept too. Because in the presence of death, Jesus senses what we sense. It's a hateful thing. It's an enemy. This is friend stuff. <laughs> Ridiculous. We know, we all know that we are not just a little drop of water slipping back into the ocean. You know, <laughs> that's how the Eastern mystical religions talk. They say, you're just a drop of water slipping back into the ocean. That's all it is. Viscerally, we know that's foolishness. Death is an enemy. <laughs> On the other hand, Christianity alone, Christi and it's biblical Christianity alone, of all the religions in the world, sees death not only as an enemy, but a defeated enemy. Yeah. <laughs> what did the Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 55? He says, Oh, death! Where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Now, <laughs> How can anybody in their right mind have the audacity to taunt death? When the apostle said, oh, death! <laughs> he was teasing it. He was taunting at it. He was basically, like a little kid does, sticking his tongue at it. How does anyone have the right and the audacity and the power to do such a thing? The answer is this. Any Christian man, any Christian woman has the power to do that because the Bible says Jesus has broken the bands of death. Yeah. The Apostle Peter said of our Lord in the first Christian sermon in history that Jesus was the one whom the Father, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. That's, that's Acts chapter 2 and, and verse 24. Huh? He was the one whom God raised up. Having loosed the, the pains of death. Because it was not possible that he should be held by it. In other words, our Lord Jesus broke the bands of death. It was not possible for them to hold him down. As a result, death cannot harm those of us who are in Christ. If Jesus died so that true believers don't have to pay for anything in their past anymore and if he was risen to be their living savior then what can death do to us if you are a true believer i dare you to taunt death come on man i said taunt it stick your tongue out at it show no fear Death is a toothless dog. It has a scary bark, but it has no bite. This dog can't even eat meat. It can lap up a little soup, maybe. But it has no threat over the believer because Jesus has broken the bands of death. So what do you say? <laughs> the real Christian says, come on, death. As you reach out your hands to strangle me, instead of breaking me, you will just only usher me into glory. The worst thing that can happen to a Christian now becomes the best thing. <laughs> the worst thing that can happen is that we die. 
In which case, it creates more power. It creates more glory in our life than ever. Death becomes to the Christian a dark tunnel into the ballroom. That's all there is to it. And so because he lives, we can face tomorrow. If you're a biblical Christian, all things are yours, whether in life or death, all things are yours. If you live through this day, then you're with God. If you die today, you'll still be with God. The Apostle Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 1, 21, for me, for to me, to live is what? Is Christ. And to die is what? Gain. A real Christian says, come on, cross. Come on, grave. The lower you lay me, the higher you raise me. Come on! What can you do to me? There is a taunting. You can bid death scorn and defiance, even though death is the number one power arrayed against a human being. Christians, look it right in the eye and say, come on, come on, spare not, do your worst. And if you try, you will only make me better than before. Go ahead, give it your best shot, because I am bound to rise again hallelujah to the lamb of god let me ask you quickly because i have to move to the next point do you have your receipt uh, you think i'm going through all this for a joke i'm asking a question do you have your receipt if you have your receipt do you have what comes with the receipt because with this receipt you have peace Oh, you didn't hear me. Yeah. I'm saying if you come out the shop and you have your receipt and somebody call you, 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 don't, you don't start to shit. Yeah. Come on, man. You have peace because you know that what you have in the cart is paid for. Come on now. Come on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm asking you if you have your receipt. Because if Jesus paid for you, <laughs> you're supposed to be a peaceful person. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else buckling. Everybody else is afraid. Everybody is intimidated. And they're wondering, what do you? You don't hear what happened? You didn't hear what happened? And of course, they'll tell you the worst news they can. And you say, okay, yes, that's bad. But, <laughs> come on. <now. laughs> you see, because you have your receipt. And because Jesus already de dealt with this question of death, you are not intimidated. You are not afraid. Real Christians are not afraid to die. If you are afraid to die... You have a problem. You may not be a real Christian. <laughs> Do you have this scorn and defiance in the face of death? And therefore, is fear really banished from your life forever? One of the ways you can tell whether or not you have peace with God, one of the ways you can tell whether you have your receipt, is how you handle death. Do you foolishly deny it? Do you carelessly sentimentalize it? Do you repress it? Are you afraid of it? If you are, then you prob that probably means that Jesus Christ might be your moral exemplar. He might be your model. He might be a great example for you. But he's not your resurrection and he's not your life. You see, you might have made him your example but you've never said to him from the bottom of your heart and in your own words, Oh Lord, I cannot in my sin ever be acceptable to the Father. But you, because you live the perfect life and imputes it to me and died vicariously for me and impute my sin to your account because your righteousness has been imputed to me. I now will hate and forsake my sin and I will trust and obey Jesus Christ alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what it means to submit to him as your resurrection and your life. Mm. When that happens, you have your receipt. Do you have your receipt? Are you living that way? Are you rejoicing in this? Can you taunt death and bid scorn and defiance to it? Or is death still an unbearable disturbance for you? <laughs> the second thing here. <laughs> What's the first thing? The victorious reality, right? But I want you to also see the victorious response. And I'm going to deal with the rest of verse 25 and verse 26, where Jesus continues, He who believes in me, 
though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen that our Lord was raised for us and that his resurrection destroys death. But we have something else here. Our Lord said, in effect, therefore, if you believe in me, two things happen. Two things happen. On the one hand, he says, he who believes in me. In other words, the resurrection reality of Christ comes to us through the little word, believe. Believe. Will somebody say believe? believe? By the way, everywhere you go in this country, people use the word believe, you know. Every religious group talking about believe, but do they really believe? What do they mean? Some, some, some think it is accept. Like you accept some facts. But Jesus doesn't call that believe. <laughs> when you believe, you trust and obey. Christ alone. I said, when you believe, you what? You trust and obey Christ. You trust what he did. Now what you do? Every false religion in this world is telling you to trust what you do. No, 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 no. Biblical Christianity is, you trust what he did. What did he do? He lived a perfect life to impute that righteousness to sinners. And then he died vicariously, uh, the ultimate death. To impute their sins to his account. When you believe, you trust that. You trust that. You don't just trust, you trust and obey. Because you got to prove that you love him. You obey him to prove. He said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. So you, 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 you obey to prove that you love him. He says, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, our Lord Jesus was actually talking about two resurrections that come into our lives right here. Two resurrections. The first one, he says in verse 25, he who believes in me, though he may be dead. Now, the scholars of the Greek text have explained that what we have here is an aorist past, which is a Greek tense that tells us that though he died at one point, yet, and then he uses the future tense, yet in the future he will live. What Jesus is saying here is, when you die, you won't stay dead, but your body will come back to life. You will get a new body in the resurrection. His point was abundantly clear. When you die, my beloved, the Bible tells us we immediately go into the conscious presence of God. Anybody who dies right now who is a true believer goes into the conscious presence of God. Yeah. The epistle of Hebrews talks about the spirits of just men made perfect worshiping at God's feet. You're disembodied. Your body goes into the grave, but your soul goes into the presence of God to begin to enjoy the benefits of glory. But unlike Greek religions and pagan religions and Eastern religions, Christians do not envision a bodiless eternity. We know there will be a resurrection when our souls that are in heaven will get a new body. And that's when we will enjoy the riches of glory forever and to the fullest. Mm. So, 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 so we don't see the body as a bad thing at all. No, God created our bodies and our souls and he's going to redeem both our bodies and our souls. Our, our Lord Jesus said the same thing as, as, as Job, you know. Jesus, Job said it hundreds of years before Jesus came. What did Job say? Job 19, verses what? 25 and 26. Job said, for I know that my redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, <laughs> this I know. What did he know? <laughs> that in my flesh, I shall see God. Will somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise? <laughs> on the last day, though our old flesh has been eaten away, we will get new flesh. The one who created us in the beginning will recreate us. Mm. 
Mm. Because he has the name which is above every name. On that day, true believers will get new bodies. Our souls in heaven will be united with our new bodies. And we shall look death in the face and say, Oh, grave, <laughs> where is your victory? In our text, our Lord also spoke of a second kind of resurrection. He said in verse 26, And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What's he talking about? He was talking about a different kind of life here. He was not talking about how our bodies get renewed and, and resurrected. Here, he was talking about a kind of life that once it starts, never goes out. Yes, that's right. Come on, you know about that kind of life because it's written in John 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16. For God so loved the world that what? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall what? But have what? If you have everlasting life, then that means that the life is forever. It's eternal. That is why anybody who say, you know, I used to be a Christian, you know, they're automatically Chinese tribunists. Because the life Jesus gives is eternal. It doesn't stop. Even when a person dies, it doesn't stop. <laughs> it continues in a new dimension. Hmm? So if somebody's so-called Christian life stops. Just, just inform them, please. What you have is not what Jesus gave. Because what Jesus gives is eternal. Okay? You, you got something, but you didn't get what he gave. Huh? <laughs> he gives eternal life. So nobody used to be a Christian. That's a joke. Once you are a biblical Christian, you will always be. Hmm? Number one, he's the best father. Anybody know that our God is the best father? Mm, and whom the Lord loves come on he's going to keep us in line sometimes we will say let me go let he, but he has a love <laughs> that will not let us go aren't you glad about that I'll give the Lord some praise for that so our Lord was saying in effect there is a spiritual resurrection that happens now mm -hmm. he talked about the physical resurrection you know as we are entering the new heavens and the new earth. Huh? But he's talking about the spiritual resurrection that, that happens now. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life. When you believe on Jesus. That spirit of God comes in and renews you and changes you. And you are transformed from one degree of splendor into the next. Until the moment of physical death. In which case that process actually becomes perfect. And you burst like a flame into the presence of God. Burning with God's own joy, God's own energy, God's own purity, and God's own perfection. So we're talking about a kind of life that starts now. That is our Lord Jesus' whole point with Martha. Martha said in effect, yes, I know, I know, I know my brother will be resurrected sometime in the distant future. And what does Jesus say? He said, hey, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection is not just a future possibility, it is a present certainty. Yeah. Our Lord Jesus is saying, whenever, well, wherever I am, there is life. Necessarily. That means that if we are in the presence of the Lord Jesus, wherever he is, there is to be a resurrection. No! That is a teaching. It's very searching. Listen. Is there anything going, in, going, going on in your life that is revolutionary? I'm asking you a question. Have you had an experience that you can describe in, 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 in this way? That your heart was changed radically so that where there was hardness, there is no softness. Come on, man. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. There was hardness at one point. You know there was hardness where you didn't want anything. Now there's softness. And you can't get enough of his word. Hmm. Something happened to you. You know something happened to you. A change has come over you. You weren't looking for it. Your friends are surprised. You mean you got saved? I'm so shocked. And how do you answer? I'm more shocked than you. <laughs> because there was hardness. Yeah. And now there is softness. There was stagnation. Now there is freshness. There was blindness. Now there is sight. There was death. Now there's life. 
can you say that something so revolutionary, something so amazing has happened in your heart and in your life? That's what he's talking about. There's been a spiritual resurrection in your life. Can you point to the moment or the process? What happened in you? Well, where you heard the word of God, and even though you heard something like that in the past, is only now you're really hearing. Only now it begins to make sense. Only now you realize, I have to change. I have to change. <laughs> if Jesus Christ hasn't changed you to the point where you can say that, then he's not your life. Because he says, I am the resurrection and the life. If I am in your presence, you're not just talking about future resurrection. You're talking about being raised right now spiritually. Change right now. Please understand that moral reformation, you know, like when people start to behave themselves. Huh? Mm -hmm. Come on, that's, that's what I mean by moral reformation. When you start to do, you know, follow the commandments, you start to behave yourself. Moral reformation is not the same thing like conversion. Moral reformation will keep you out of Her Majesty's prison, but it won't keep you out of hell. Unless we are spiritually resurrected, moral reformation will not change our situation in the eyes of God. It's not a matter of simply obeying a few rules. Hmm? <laughs> we have to be changed from within. Where we begin to hate the evil in the world. We don't want any part of that system. If you read the Bible and believe the Bible, but only as a morally upright person instead of a spiritually resurrected person, do you know what will happen? You will just feel more and more superior to other people. You become self-righteous. Because you'll say, okay, but at least, I can't believe they did that. I, I, I have never done that. <laughs> and you start to behave like you're better than people. And you know nothing goes up. You know that's not true. But if you're spiritually resurrected, as you read the Bible, you will find that the Bible is alive in you. It's large in you. Have, you. have you ever tasted something so sweet that you're looking for more? It's, the Bible becomes that to you. It melts in your mouth. It's alive in you. It dawns on you. Let me read what Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Or even I can, I can quote a similar text in, in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 29 where the question is asked, Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? The word is powerful. It really becomes alive to you. Is spiritual resurrection going on in your life right now? It's cuts two ways, does it not? On the one hand, look at yourself. What is looming over your life? What are the big obstacles in your life? If you're a Christian, if you believe in Christ, if you have submitted to him as your resurrection and your life, and not just as a moral example, do you realize that nothing, and I mean literally nothing, can actually stop God from accomplishing his purposes in your life, which is to make you both holy and joyful? That means that... <laughs> Whatever is in our lives that is holding us back has to come down. It is written in Jude, Jude verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling <laughs> and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with what? Exceeding joy. Stop a, month, stop a while here. Just think about it. Our Lord Jesus Christ is going to present true believers as perfect before the throne with great rejoicing. Listen. The greatest joy possible is to rejoice in our own beauty. But without a shred of self-importance, without a shred of pride, just delighting in knowing that we please Christ and also that it is he who has done this in us. <laughs> he is the one who is making us beautiful. He is the one who has made us and has presented us faultless and spotless and without blemish before the throne with great rejoicing. Do you really want this? Is there a part of us that desires that? Are we rejoicing in that? But there's another side to it, you know. On the other hand, are we actually using this resurrection power in our lives? 
You know, the best thing that can happen today is to demonstrate the resurrection power in our lives, is to actually kill a particular sin that is obvious in our experience. Yes, yes, yes. You can find out if there's resurrection power if you if you if you be honest about a particular besetting sin and kill it today. Kill it. Kill it. And you know exactly what it is. Other people may not know, but you know what it is. Because it is sins like like this besetting sin in us that hold us back and keep that life-giving resurrection power from flowing through our bodies. So I say to you, prove that there's resurrection power. Find that besetting sin in your life and kill it. Kill, kill it today. Yeah. Don't just stop it. Act with hatred towards it and remove access to it. Mortify it. Kill it today. Yeah. Kill it today. <laughs> if you're a biblical Christian, Look at a sin in your life. Look at something in your life that is holding back the resurrection power. Something that is continuing to allow decay and, and breakdown to happen in your life. And say, Lord, Lord, by your grace and power, I'm going to kill that thing today. I'm going I'm to make myself an active enemy of death in my life today. I'm going to kill it. Yes, Lord, I believe. You have to say it. Because he asked you, do you believe? Do you? Say yes. I believe if you are believing for the first time this morning or even if you are believing again because you sense revival is coming in your life then all of that resurrection reality comes in. What is the link between I am the resurrection and the life and all the great things that can happen in your life? Believe! Believe! Trust what Jesus did! And obey him to show your love for him. Believe. Submit to Christ as your resurrection and your life. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I'm closing. But I must clarify that victory over death, and I'm talking about the resurrection, victory over death is more than optimism. It's more than optimism for a biblical Christian. It is hope in Christ. Are y'all hearing me? You know, a lot of people, <laughs> if you turn on Joel Osteen, that's what you'll hear. Hmm? He's about optimism, positive thinking. And that's why his crowd is so big. Eh? He's telling them, just be positive and you can get anything. And they're thinking about money and cars and house and land and, and health and wealth. And <laughs> just be optimistic, positive thinking. That's not what I am talking about. According to one reform scholar, J.I. Packer, I quote, Optimism hopes for the best without any guarantee of it arriving and is often no more than whistling in the dark. He continues, Christian hope, by contrast, is faith looking ahead to the fulfillment of the promises of God as when the burial service inters the corpse in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he continues, optimism is a wish without warrant. Christian hope is a certainty guaranteed by God himself. Optimism reflects ignorance as to whether good things will ever actually come. Christian hope expresses knowledge that every day of his life and every moment beyond it, the believer can say with truth on the basis of God's own commitment that the best is yet to come. <laughs> the best is yet to come. <laughs> so what do I say about this? I'm, I'm sitting down. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. But listen, what, 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 what do I say about all these things? Where does my mind land? Where does it rest when I hear all these things again? Because my Lord Jesus is the resurrection and the life, I am enabled to sing and I am able to say without fear of contradiction, only faintly now I see him with the darkling veil between. But a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen. Hey, hey, what rejoicing! 
in his presence when our banished grief and pain when the crooked ways are straightened and the dark things shall be plain face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry skies face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by hallelujah hallelujah to the Lamb of God Amen. Amen. Amen.